Lift your voice at us. Who am I that the highest would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, his Free. 
freedom today. Free at last, he has ransomed his raised hands. While I was a slave to Jesus, I Is he died. Oh, he died. Because we know who we are, we can sing. We're so thankful, God, that we know who we are today. God, because of what you said about us, God, the grace and mercy that you show us, Lord. Come on, maybe this is your guys' testimony today. We can lift our voice. All these pieces broken and scattered. Mercy gathered, mended and cold. Empty handed, but not forsaken. I've been set free. I've been set free. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved.
us today. Father, we thank you, Lord. God, we thank you for that amazing grace. God, we thank you, Lord, that even while we were yet sinners, you died for us. Father, we thank you for the love of God that's been shed abroad in our hearts. And God, we're praying for our nation. We're praying for our communities. We're praying for our cities and our families of how we need you, God, how we need your love and your power flowing through our lives. God, we ask you this morning relationally and spiritually and emotionally, financially, Father God, that you are our source and we look to you. God, our eyes are upon you today. God, we're not looking anywhere else. We're looking to you. You're our hope. You're our help. God, we ask you for those online watching, those in our campuses, those that are here in this auditorium. God, make yourself known today in every heart and every life and we honor you for that in jesus name and everybody said amen come on would you give the lord a good hand clap turn around maybe high five about three or four people come on high five them say it's good to see you in the house of the lord today amen you may be seated for just a couple of minutes i want to welcome you glad that you are here i'm pastor phil 
lead pastor here, all of our online audience. We greeted some of you a little bit earlier. Some of you have come in the room today. Thank you so much for joining us. Our campus is in Hebron and Wanata and North Hudson. They'll be online here just shortly. But we are so glad that you are here. Hey, if you're a first-time guest, would you do me a great big favor? We'd love to connect with you. There's a little thanks for joining us card right in front of you in the seat there. And if it takes you about 120 seconds just to fill this out, what does this do? It gives us some, some information, lets us connect with you, lets you know some things that's happening, be able to keep you connected. We have a lot of things that's going on uh, in 2021. We're excited about that, and we'd love to connect with you. And if you can fill that out in just a couple of minutes, we're going to be honoring the Lord in stewardship. You can come and drop it in the offering bucket, or you can come back at the guest services area and connect with us back there. Somebody be back at the booth, drop this off. And when you do that, We've got a gift for you. We've got a, a Amazon gift card, and uh, we'll, we'll get that to you. All we need is a little information, and make sure you get that. Probably nobody but me ever buys anything on Amazon, but, uh, but if you don't use it, just send it to me. I guarantee you I will use it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, God just done some amazing things. want to remind you, next Sunday is Valentine's Day. Well, we got, we got a lot of things happening next Sunday. Matter of fact, next Sunday... We've never, ever did this. We've been here 20 years. We, I've never, we've never did this, man. We have actually set it up where Rhonda and Leslie, your Pastor Matt's wife, Leslie, Miss Rhonda, my wife, they're going to be on stage with us next week as we talk about relationship. we got two generations, and we're going to talk about all this month. We're going to be talking about relationships. Pastor Matt's going to kick us off today with about the main thing in our relationship. But next Sunday, Leslie's going to be on stage. Rhonda will be here. Matt and I, we're going to sit back, and we're going to enjoy what the Lord is going to be doing. But then Sunday at 5 o'clock, we have our annual business meeting. And we do this once a year at the end of the year. You're going to be amazed at what God did through this church in 2020. And I know we share with you some stuff along the way. But we have a tendency that we have memory loss and we forget. We are forgetful people. And you'll be reminded. We, we have a financial report we'll be sharing with you. And we encourage all members particularly show up. But you don't have to be a member. You can show up. You're invited to join us. 5 o'clock, and then we're going to roll right into prayer, praise, and water baptism next weekend. So it's just going to be an exciting, exciting Sunday next week, starting at 8.15, 9.45, and then back here at 5 o'clock next Sunday night. We are so thankful for what God is doing. Tonight, our youth and our Royal Rangers and Missionettes, <clears throat> they're going to start at 4.30 tonight rather than uh, uh, 5.45 because there's a little ball game happening. They call it the Super Bowl or something. I don't know. But hey, so if you have kids or grandkids, get them here at 430 before the end doors open up about 415 or so. They're going to enjoy that. Hey, would you stand with me? I want to pray with you as you get ready to give. Some of you have already given online. Thank you so much for your stewardship. Thank you for, for just your investment and uh, trusting us to invest in the kingdom. And we've done that so very, very well. As again, you'll see some of the things uh, from last year's stewardship. And we're well on our way already this year. We've already picked up two brand new missionaries in January starting out. And we're excited that this church has a heart for the world. You know, sometimes in the United States, if we're not careful, we think the United States is just, uh, it's just about us. You know, it's just about... Can I tell you, God's kingdom is bigger than the United States. You understand that? And if we're not careful, we lose sight of that. We think the world gets wrapped up in us and all. We're all wrapped up in God and his kingdom and all the nations of the world. A great commitment to the great commission is what makes a great church. And you help us do that, and we thank you for that. Some of you, again, have already given online. There's ways you can do that. There's a couple kiosks set up outside in the areas. And... Uh, we just thank you this morning, and I just want to pray. Father, thank you again for this incredible church. Thank you for guests that's here today. Thank you, Father God, of, of life changes happening, testimonies, Father, that we continue to hear about in all the campuses and all the areas of ministry. 
Father, we ask you today to bless your people today as they give and they honor you in their stewardship this morning. Father, we honor you today that your favor and your blessing is upon us in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. Hey, so as they continue to worship, would you just bring your tithe and offering? If you have one, put it in the offering bucket. And then Pastor Matt's coming to lead us in a great message today. The same God that never fails will not bear me now. You won't bear me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. Working all things out. Oh, yes, I will bid you high the lowest valley. your name. Oh yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh yes, I will. Oh, we will, Lord. We worship your name. Come on, church, let's sing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now with the waiting. The same God who's never late, working all things out, working all things out. Oh, yes, I will get you high. Nothing can stand against and I choose to pray to glorify, glorify the name of all name. Nothing can stand against. Oh yes, I will get you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. if you're glad of that today come on for the love of Jesus hey I want you to go ahead and grab your seat this morning want to welcome you uh, here to our Valpo campus want to welcome all of our first time guests I know I met a couple of you this morning before service want to welcome all of you uh, at our other locations at Hebron North Judson Wanata you're watching in your living room all across the country come on can you put your hands together and make some noise come on for everyone else not in the room with us, but they're here with us. So good to see all of you today on this beautiful February Sunday morning, the month of love. Okay, maybe most of you don't think that, but all right, February is the month of love. And uh, hey, I want you to get your worship gods out this morning. 
as we get ready to uh, continue our series on momentum. We're going to be looking at momentum in our relationships this month. And for all the single people out there that you're like, oh, this is a Sunday I came to church. We're talking about relationships. I'm not even married. I don't have nobody. Listen, relationships is more than just a spouse. Amen. Relationships can be the people you work with. It can be them kids getting on your nerves, right? It can be the family members that you want to ignore. That's also relationships. And so this month, we're going to be looking at relationships. Next Sunday, Pastor Phil mentioned it. Miss Leslie and Miss Rhonda will be up here with us, and we'll be talking. And uh, no telling what's going to be said. I'm just going to tell you right now, just bring your popcorn next Sunday because ain't no telling. Some of y'all saw Miss Ethel during the play, and y'all think that was just a character. That's Sister Rhonda's alter ego that comes out. And, uh, and my wife, you pray for her, she hates me right now because I'm making her speak with me, but she always does an amazing job, and she looks beautiful when she does it. So, uh, so hey, brownie points, hello, come on, brownie points, and uh, y'all like, just shut up and get to your message. Matthew chapter 22 is where we're going today, and uh, as we talk about momentum in our relationships, and the title of my message is, It All Starts Here. Can you say that with me? It all starts here. Matthew chapter 22, we're going to look at, if I can set up the uh, text a little bit for you. Uh, we've got some people coming to Jesus asking questions, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Uh, if you've ever read the Bible uh, much, they're a group of people, very religious in their activity. Uh, they were always about checking the boxes, doing the right things, right? They always focus a lot on the external things and never really much on the heart and uh so the Sadducees have come to Jesus, and they would, many times they would catch Jesus out in public, and they would come to him and ask Jesus questions, trying to get him to slip up and uh, trying to get him to say something that was incorrect. How many of you know you can't slip up the creator of the universe, right? <laughs> kind of hard to do that. And uh, so the Sadducees show up, and they ask Jesus a question, and Jesus kind of shuts them down. And the Pharisees, which is a different group of people that I can kind of just imagine in my mind, they're probably like, listen, we got this one. Y'all just step to the side. Y'all don't know how to ask Jesus questions. And so the Pharisees put up uh, an attorney, a lawyer, comes to Jesus and asks a question that is really uh, quite simple. Some theologians think he's asking this question to try to mess Jesus up and to catch him like many times they would. Some people think that this particular gentleman legitimate had a question and that there were some hard things going on in his life. And so he comes to Jesus in chapter 22 of Matthew. That's in the New Testament. If you've got your Bibles, maybe you've got a version app on your phone. You can follow along. If not, we got it on the screen for you. And in verse 34, the Bible says, Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, he was an attorney, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Pretty good question, right? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Can we pray one more time today? God, I thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy. God, thank you, Lord, for Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. And it's because of him that we get to have a relationship with you today. And so, God, I pray for every person that is here in this room. God, every person that is watching online at another location. God, maybe they're watching in their living room today. God, I pray that you would open our eyes, our hearts, our minds, our ears to what it is you have to say today. God, let them not just hear my voice, but God, let them hear you speaking today. Challenge and change every one of us. Let us leave different than how we came in this place today. In Jesus' mighty name, and everybody said amen. 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 It all starts here. Matthew chapter 22, we see an exchange of Jesus and these uh, Pharisees. And when the Pharisees had heard that Jesus had answered the Sadducees correctly, I can kind of imagine their their chest kind of puffing up, thinking, man, you just don't know how to ask the right questions, and we're going to get him, you know, the right way. And so here comes an attorney, a well-versed expert in the law, history teaches us, and ask a very simple question to Jesus, which is the greatest commandment of the law? During those days, this was a question that would be debated quite often 
Many times these two groups of individuals would get together with other individuals and it was their way to tout kind of their notoriety. It was their way to tout their education as they would begin to debate with each other which law was the greatest. Now we know in Old Testament, if you go read in, in Exodus and in Genesis, Exodus, you start reading about the nation of Israel, that Moses becomes the leader for the nation of Israel. He becomes God's appointed person. And one day Moses is hanging out with God on a mountain and God gives him commandments. How many commandments were there? Come on, you could talk to me. Ten commandments, right, is how many Moses gets. And so that becomes the rules that people begin to follow, these ten commandments. Thou shalt love the Lord your God. Thou shalt not have no other before me. Thou shalt honor your parents and your mother, right? Parents, that was a good time to say amen to your kids on that one. Shall, you shall not steal. You shall not kill. All of those things you shall not covet, right, that we know. By this time that Jesus comes to the scene, we know through history and through theology as we study that the Sadducees and Pharisees, this religious group of people, have now taken the ten, as if that was not hard enough to keep, and has now made it well over 600 commandments to keep. So oftentimes they would get together and they would debate and they would ask each other and they would talk to each other about which one was the heaviest and the, and the weightiest. And, 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 in their, and in this case, they come to Jesus not necessarily to gain insight possibly, but to hopefully catch him slipping up and to be able to hold something against him. The Sadducees and Pharisees were this group of people that they did a good job framing everything in their life to make it look as if they had it all together. A lot of times, and uh, many times often in these group of people, their heart was wrong, but they had such a, a good way of communicating. They knew the commandments so well. They studied them that in the public's eye, they could frame it in such a way that people would look at them and say, man, they are so well. And don't get it twisted because we do it still today on social media. We can frame things the right way to make it look one way when really it was the other. Like you ever seen the beautiful family picture of everybody posing and smiling? You're like, oh my gosh, they're so adorable. Look at the kids and the husband. He dressed up. I can't believe she got him to do that. And you see the frame of the picture, but you didn't see the 30-minute scream fest leading up to the picture. Come on, parents. We've all been there, right? You didn't see the husband rolling his eyes. I don't even know why we got to do family pictures again. We did family pictures once, and now we got to do them again. You don't see the mom dragging the kid over by the arm, threatening their life. So help me, God, if you don't smile, I will get rid of you, right? Come on, moms. You know good and well you do that. The husband's like, why are we here? It's Saturday. I should be watching sports. But you see, but you're able to frame it, and you see it in the right light. And I've come to understand that when we frame things in the right way, it's really easy to trick people. Matter, matter of fact, I found this cool photo, this death-defying photo of this dude who's just shredded, by the way. I think maybe hopefully one day I'll look like him. But he's hanging off of this rock. I mean, just two hands. He's over a cliff. You can't tell. That's a gentleman's body of water. Uh, and there's another picture of another gentleman, I think just legit, just hanging on by one arm. That dude, like my stomach gets in knots looking at that photo. I don't like heights. Anybody else afraid of heights? I hate heights. And those of you who aren't afraid of heights, something's wrong with you because you shouldn't be up that high. And this rock is actually a famous rock in Brazil. And I begin to look at it and and you can frame it in the right way because really, if you show the next picture, what it looks like is really just a rock that's like two feet off the ground. Joker's fooling people right now. And uh, oftentimes people go there and they'll take it. And not only does this, well, like people line up to take a picture right here. And uh, I show you that photo because, again, we can do the same thing in our own lives. We can frame it in a way it makes it look like something that it's really not. We can make it look like the marriage that we really wish we had, but it's really not the marriage we have. We can take the right photo in the right, line in, in the right lighting and put a smile on our face and look like we have joy, but it's really just counterfeit. It's really just fake. That word counterfeit, if you study it out, it means to imitate something that is authentic. To imitate something that is authentic with the intent to, to destroy or replace the original. Matter of fact, it's counterfeit. The legal term is it's used as an Ill illegal transaction. And I think a lot of times in our relationships in life, again, I'm not talking about just husband and wife, but friendships and, and, and parent to kid and coworker to coworker, we can counterfeit things in our life to make it look like one thing when all in all reality is something totally different. Y'all looking at me all crazy. Let me give you an example. Like counterfeit spiritual security, it looks like this. It says that my security is based on how good I am. 
So what counterfeit spiritual security does, it will make you wear yourself out. Come on, you ever done this before? Trying to do all of the right things, trying to check all the right boxes, trying to make sure I got to dot every I and cross every T. And, and we feel good, but really it's not the, 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 the real spiritual security that we have in Christ Jesus, that we have because of what Jesus did on the cross. It doesn't matter how good I am. It doesn't matter if I get it right on Monday and if I get it wrong on Wednesday. But when I come to Christ Jesus and I surrender my life to him and I accept the price that he paid on the cross, and, and even in spite of my perfections, imperfections, the Bible says that he still loves me. And then there's counterfeit peace and joy. And counterfeit peace and joy says it's based upon outside circumstances. And oh, can't that be very dangerous? Because if my peace and joy is based upon outside circumstances and things going well in my life, when things don't go well in my life, guess what? I don't have much peace and I don't have much joy. Matter of fact, this past Friday, I had to apologize to my wife. I was being the biggest jerk ever. Y'all, and I know y'all are super saved, and this never happens to y'all. But to me, like we have a pellet burner in our house, and you know, the cold temperatures. God love Northwest Indiana that are coming. It wasn't working right, and our, he- our house is not heating up. And I'm frustrated, and I go outside to get my Jeep, which is in like uh, my, my garage area, and the garage door won't open up. And I'm just like, why does God hate me today, right? You ever been there before? And I was just walking around angry. Just angry, taking it out on my wife, taking it out on anyone, on the kids. And she's like, I don't know what your problem is, but you need to fix this and just leave me alone until you fix it. And uh, again, if her joy and peace was based upon who I was, how many of you know that Friday her joy and peace would have been robbed? Come on. All right. And again, a lot of times in life we can let our joy and peace be driven by outside circumstances, are driven by people as well. And if that relationship is not right or if the circumstances are right, then then I get robbed of my joy and peace. Counterfeit value, it says this, it is based upon what group I am a part of. So if I'm a part of the right social group, if I make the right amount of money, if I'm going to the, if I'm getting invited to the right places, then I have value. But if not, I find my value being, being, uh, being depleted, counterfeit living. It says, it's my life, so I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I mean, that's counterfeit living. Well, Pastor Matt, I mean, I'm just, it's 2021. I barely made it out of 2020. And so, I mean, I'm just going to do, I just got to do me. Just got to live my life my way, do it, make decisions on my own. And we think that's living, but it's really not. Counterfeit love says it is based upon my performance. All right, come on. And again, so it says something like this, I love you because you've earned it. I love you because it's merit-based. And, and when you act properly, then I love you properly. And it's this counterfeit love. And I, I love you, and it's based upon your performance in life. So again, like when you're doing well, I love you. I love you because you're worth it. I love you because you love me. It's all of this counterfeit love that we see in our, in our world today and even we experience in our own life. But Jesus comes on the scene, and he gives us this total different look of what love looks like, that it's not counterfeit, it's not merit Based. It's not based upon who we are, but it's this word of unconditional love that it's not limited by conditions, that is absolute. And so Jesus comes on the scene. He leaves his heavenly world and he comes to this earth to die on a, on a cross for our sins to show us how much that he loves us. And at the cross, there is no counterfeit. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, even when we didn't deserve it, and we were, even when we weren't thinking about him, even when I didn't know how to get to him, he came to me unconditional love the Bible says a greater love has no one than this and he laid down his life for his friend and so here we find in our text in Matthew chapter 22 Jesus gets asked a question that is real and a legitimate answer and he's about to show us and these people what real love looks like he's about to give a good picture of what it looks like to be a real follower of of Christ and what it even looks like to have this real, absolute, this unconditional love. And and he shows us, if I could take you back to our text, and I want you to write this down. He shows us first this, that love must always start with him. You can put yourself in the story. You're hanging out in the crowd, and they come up and they say, Jesus, what's the greatest? There's over 600. What's the greatest commandment? And Jesus, he responds, 
In verse 37, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Jesus responds to this question. These are Sadducees and Pharisees, very well-educated men who know the Bible. They know the Old Testament. They know the Shema and the Torah. They know the Ten Commandments. They know over 600 now commandments. They can recite them at will. Jesus responds to his question by citating Deuteronomy 6 and 5. Deuteronomy 6 and 5 that says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And, and, and he responds in a way, it's, it's the best known command to these individuals. It's the number one, it's the numero uno, even in their life. It's a part of the Shema. It's a matter of fact, it was an ancient prayer that was recited by the Jews twice a day. This was something that they would pray over their life. And so Jesus starts the conversation as he answers it. He starts it by putting it right back where they know to start. He says it first starts with loving God. And this is what I've come to understand in my life, and this is what I tell people all the time. Until you know God, you have no idea what love is. The feelings that we have towards people, maybe they're good, maybe they're well intended, but until I know my Heavenly Father, until I know Jesus, the Son of God who paid the price on the cross for my sins, until I have a relationship with Him and I experience that full, unconditional love that in spite of my shortcomings, in spite of my issues, in spite of the obstacles that I have, that He still chooses to love me. And because of that love, I don't feel guilty. I don't feel condemned. But because of that love, out of surrender, I want to give back to Him. Until I know Him, I don't even have a clue of what love is. Is. And Jesus starts it right there. He's telling them, listen, I love my wife. Come June, we'll be married 17 years, which is crazy to know. 17 years in June. I love her unconditionally, and I know she loves me unconditionally. But you can ask her this question, and her response will be the same that I would give you. My wife does not complete me. You're like, I can't believe he said that. She's got to speak with you next week. And you said that in front of everybody. My wife does not complete me. I do not complete my wife. Why do I not complete my wife? Because I am not perfect. I got a lot of issues. She's got a lot of issues. I got a lot of problems. She's got a lot of problems. And hear me this morning. Many times in life when we begin, let me talk to some of the single people in the room, and even the married people, this will help you. When we try to look at other people for our completeness, we're always going to be felt, feeling left short. They will never complete you. They can be a, a, a huge added value in your life. They can be a huge partnership. But, but every time I love teenagers, when they, I start talking to them about day, like, oh, he completes me. I'm like, girl, you crazy. He don't complete you. <laughs> or, he'll, or a guy come to me, she just, Pastor Matt, she's just so pretty, and she just completes me. Listen, the only person who could ever complete you is your heavenly father. That's the only, only way you will ever find true love. That's the only way. My love is not completed until it starts with God. I will never really know the power of love until I first know love God. See, two broken individuals don't make one whole person. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Two broken individuals, guess what, makes two more jacked up broken individuals. Because <laughs> you know what I do? I put my brokenness on, on the other person. Yeah. And they put their brokenness up on me. But Jesus came to this world and he becomes broken so you and I don't have to be broken so we can be fulfilled, so we can be healed, so we can experience real peace and real joy. And Jesus reminds us right with this answer. He says, if you want to know what real love is, it first has to start with God. And then he takes them a step further. Not only does it start there, but watch. He says, love must always be all in. Because look at what he says. He says, love the Lord your God. Can you read this with me? Let's read this all together. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. To love the way that Jesus has designed us to love, you and I must understand that, that we must be all in. That it takes every part of us. 
And it's not something that we can do on our own. Again, that's why Jesus tells us you got to first start with God. Because this is something outside of my human, my human recollection. This is something outside of my human tendencies. This is something outside of my human nature to love someone the way that God loves me. So he says we have to start with God. And we come to him and we love him with our heart. He starts right there with the heart. It's the heart that, ex- and he excludes all half-heartedness. He excludes anything that would get in the way. And, 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 he, and he mentions the heart first because it's the heart, it's the heart that is the seat of the emotions. Yeah. Right. That's why Proverbs 4.23, it says, guard your heart because everything flows from it. Yeah. Matthew 15.18 says, out of the uh, mouth, the heart speaks. And there's often times in my life where I can catch myself saying something and, or I can catch myself thinking something and I think the problem is what came out of my mouth or I think the problem is what I thought about when really the problem was what was already right here. Because if it was never right here, it would have never came out here. And if it was never right here, it would have never came out here. Here, so Jesus starts right there. He says, not only does it start with God, with loving God, he says, but it's an all-in love that it takes everything. It starts with your heart. And then he goes on, he says, your soul and your mind. And this is the center of the personality in man and woman. This depicts this love that is that is all-inclusive as far as using everything that we can. And now watch this. Jesus was not giving an example of a love that is compartmentalized in our life. Jesus just didn't say love the heart. No, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He, he wasn't saying like, like compartmentalize your love because that's what we do many times when we get ourselves in trouble. I'll show you. On Sunday mornings, we're really good at loving God. But what does it look like on Tuesdays when we're at work? What does it look like on Thursday nights when we're sitting in our living room and no one's around? What does it look like on, on a Friday night when that computer's in our hands and nobody's watching? Well, oh, we're good at loving God on Sunday morning. We come and, and we raise our hands and we sing a song. And the pastor says, turn around and high five somebody. And we do. And we give them knuckles. And we say, what's up? And we smile. Jesus was, was giving us this attitude now, though, that, that loving God, if, if we wanted to experience this love, if we want to know what it's all about, if we want to experience the love of Christ in our own life, that it's going to take every aspect and every part of our life, that it's not just something we do on Sundays when we're at church, but on Tuesdays when we're in that job, on Thursdays when we're sitting in that classroom, on Saturdays when we're on that sports field, that it's something that we do all inclusive of our life he says it it takes all of of, of ourselves the heart the soul the mind collectively it represents the whole person he said it's a love for God that should be out of total devotion my question for you and I today is what area in our life have we still not totally surrendered and are we not loving God with What area of our life doesn't have the heart and the soul and the mind? What area of our life are we still keeping pushed back? And we're saying, oh, but God, I'm not ready to surrender that to you yet. Jesus said if you want to understand what this love is all about, it first starts with him. And then it's something that must be all in. It's this kind of love for God that then results in obedience. You can't be a half-hearted Christian. You won't last very long. You can't be a half-hearted spouse. Your marriage won't last very long. You can't raise your kids in a half-hearted way. You want to sell them jokers quick because they get on your nerves. (laughs) Right? You can't love people in a, oh, I know this is a tough tough thing for us to experience today but listen I wonder what it would look like in our life because he doesn't stop there when he talks about this kind of love that when my heart when my soul when my mind when they're all in watch what happens he takes us a little deeper and he says love must always include other people oh snap you lost me on that one Jesus again here comes this individual you go back and you read, he asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment, right? Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, your mind, strength. This is the greatest commandment. I would have I ran away from Jesus before he could say anything else to me because this is how Jesus works. 
How many of you know that sometimes you go to God in prayer for one thing, and he prays, and as you're praying, he, he begins to answer that prayer, but then he points something out to you, like, well, hold up, I wasn't even praying about that. Why are you talking to me about my attitude right now? I'm praying that they need to get saved, and you're trying to talk to me about my attitude. Why? Come on, you ever done that before? That he'll answer, God has, a, has an amazing way that he answers your question and he answers what you're asking, but then he always points to something else that you didn't even realize. That's exactly what Jesus does right here. Love must always include other people because look at verse 39. He says, and the second is like it. Hold up, I didn't ask about number one and two. I just said number one. He goes, and the second is like this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Oh, now he's going to go somewhere. Oh, we're good at shouting about the love of God in our life, right? We love talking about that. Oh, I can talk all day about how much Jesus loves me because of what Jesus did on the cross. Man, I can love him back. Man, I just, I want to read my Bible. And on Mondays, I have a morning devotion. And I turn on worship on Tuesdays. You know, I have a little quiet time. I fast. On Wednesdays, I get on social media. And there's a world prayer meeting. I'm around with everybody in the whole world. And we pray all night on prayer. And on Thursdays, then I go to my Bible studies. And on Fridays, we have my family devotion, right? Come on. We, we can talk all, all day about our love for God and his love for us. But, but here's my question, and you ain't got to answer this out loud because they might be sitting right next to you. But, but what makes it, and what do you find the most difficult about loving your neighbor? Your neighbor is not just someone who lives across the street. Your neighbor is your spouse. Your neighbor is your kids. Your neighbor is that person that you go to work with that you try to avoid. You duck your head down just to get to your office really fast. Y'all don't ever do that. Your neighbor is that person on the sports team with you. Your neighbor is that person that you sit by at the lunch table. Jesus now goes beyond, watch this, he goes beyond the original question. The question was simply, what's the greatest commandment? He gave the answer, the greatest commandment. It starts with him. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second, he goes beyond it. He says the second, which really means that this commandment is just as of equal importance. I, I, I'm reminded, now he's about to get to the heart of the issue and I'm reminded in Matthew chapter 19, the Bible tells a story of a rich young ruler. And this man was wealthy. He had the fame. He had the money. He had the cars. He had the ladies. I mean, this dude was famous. And he comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, what must I do to inherit earth or to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, knowing this young man, begins to rattle off again the commandments, the, the rules. And this young man's like, please, I got this all day. Check. And Jesus says something else. Check. And Jesus says something else. Check. And then Jesus looks at him. You go read it, Matthew chapter 19. And, and, the, and the young man goes, I've done all of that, Jesus, so what must I do? He says, sell everything you have and give it to the poor and come follow me. And the Bible says that the rich young man, he left sad because he wasn't willing to do it. He had a question and Jesus stuck now and struck down to the heart. And it's this divine thing that now we talk about this divine love that Jesus is going to speak about is not only a love that works vertically, it's also a love that works horizontally. It's easy to love this way. Come on. Don't look at me like y'all are super saved and you got this already. It's easy to love this way. It's hard to love this way. It's, it's hard to love the people that you work with. It's hard to love your spouse Sometimes it's hard to love your kids. It's hard to keep that relationship. And what Jesus is showing, loving your neighbor as yourself, that it's this love, this love that always will include action. It's easy to say I love somebody, but am I willing to show it? It's easy to say I forgive someone, but am I willing to show it? It's easy to say I've moved past that. It doesn't bother me anymore, but are you willing to show it? Oh, it's quiet in here today. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. It's easy to love this way, 
But it's difficult to love this way. And Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. He says it starts there. That's where it begins. And it has to be an all-in thing. And the way he started and he answered the question the way he did on purpose is because he was showing us unless you get that first, you'll never get the second. Unless you understand how to love the Heavenly Father, and, and for Him to love you, you'll never fully be able to comprehend how to love people that you disagree with. How to love people different than how, or how to love people that voted differently than how you voted. Hello. How to love people that have a different skin color than what you have. have a, how to love di people different than, that come from a different background socially and economically. How to love people different that think a little bit different than you. That's what Jesus is saying. He says, listen, if you want to know how, what the greatest thing you can do, yes, love your Father. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the first thing. you got to get that right. But after you get that, when you get that, he says, you got to learn how to love your neighbor as yourself. Because he shows us, watch this. The fourth thing he says, he shows us love is where it all begins. Because look at verse 40. He says, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Moses had ten. At this point in time in their life, they had made over 600. Jesus said, everything that you know about, that you read about, that you've studied, it all hinges on those two. These interpreters, these Jewish leaders had long recognized the value of each law, of these two laws. They understood this was part of the laws that they taught. But now Jesus is the first to fuse the two together and place them above everything else they've ever taught and learned. The, 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 these two commandments are, are the greatest because they all flow, everything else flows from them is what he's saying. He basically says it like this, that if you don't learn how to love, you can't do nothing else. Don't even think about it. He goes, don't even think about the honor your mother and father. Don't even think about the thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. If you can't love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, if you can't love your neighbor as yourself, he goes, you ain't got nothing else left. Come on, Lindsay. The commands to love God and to other people, watch this. It does not replace the instructions. That's not what Jesus was saying. So not saying that the other things are not important, but rather he was saying obedience to these First two fulfills everything else in the kingdom of God. That obedience to these first two fulfills everything in the kingdom of God. That when I can love God with all my heart, my soul, my mind, my strength, when I can love people as myself, when I can love them even though they look different, when I can love them even though they think different, when I can love them even though sometimes we may disagree, when I can love them. And I don't mean like fake love them. I mean like truly love them where I can pray blessings over them, when I can pray, pray a, a prayers of prosperity, when I can look at them and say, I really, I pray that God blesses your life. And when I can look at them and I can work alongside of them, even though sometimes we disagree and even though sometimes we may not get along, when I can look at them with the love of Christ. He reveals that the issue, watch this, is not that they need, I didn't say this in the first service, but I wrote it down. The issue for these men and for us, he's saying it's not that you need to fix what you need to say. He says you got to fix your source. And hear me this morning. I wonder if the American church, and I say church with a big C, I don't mean just Heartland and North Judson and Hebron and Wanata and those of you watching online, I mean the American church as a whole. I wonder, could it be said of us, God help us, but could it be said that maybe we've lost ground because we've got caught up in more debates than we did loving people? Oh, I'm going to get in your driveway now for a second. We, we got caught in more arguments instead of loving people. And the very thing, the very thing that we've despised about our world, the cancel culture, we've begun the cancel culture in our own life. Oh, Holy Spirit, help us. Oh, they don't think like I think, Pastor Matt. The Bible says you got to love them. I think they're trying to do this. The Bible says you got to love them. I pray for the president. I pray for the mayor that we have. I pray for the governor that we have now, just like I did before November. Why? Because I love them. 
I want to see them succeed. Well, don't you know? The Bible says you got to love them. And, and, and I wonder if we as an American church, oh, I know this is hard. Holy Spirit, help us. But my love for people does not give, go away just because we disagree. My love for people does not go away just because they even let me down. My love for people does not go away just because maybe we don't see eye to eye on things. Or my love for people doesn't go away just because I understand now that they're human. Then that's our problem that we really have. You go look at the Bible. The Pharisees and Sadducees, they always struggled with this. They always accepted Jesus' Jesus's humanity. They struggled with his divinity. They saw him as a teacher, saw him as a good man, saw him as a prophet, but they struggled with him being the son of God. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't agree and they didn't see his divinity. Where we struggle in our American culture, we like to make people so divine that we forget about their humanity. That we realize that we are imperfect that we will let each other down, that I will disappoint my wife. I will disappoint my kids. I will, as a pastor, disappoint. And, and, and I wonder, though, how much more effective we would be if we walked out these doors and we went to our jobs and we went to our classrooms, that we didn't make it about the debates or the arguments or the things going on in this world or the things that could weigh us down. But if we walked out, we said, you know what, this week, I'm going to love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you know what? It's going to be hard. Oh, it's going to be so tough because I see what they put on social media. But I'm going to love my neighbor. Right. It's going to be so tough because, oh, man, last year they did me wrong. They said something. But, but I'm going to love my, my neighbor. And, and I think we get so caught up. And, again, Jesus, what Jesus was he doing, he was reminding them. He was reminding us if you have love, you have nothing. That love is not part of the commandments. Watch this. Love is the beginning of the commandments. The Bible says that Jesus came to this cross. Why? Because of love. And, and I can go to John chapter 13 if I had time and I could take you. And, and Jesus is hanging out with his disciples and, and, they, and Jesus has washed their feet and he, he's broke bread with them. This is about to be the last time that they have a hangout before his death and his crucifixion. And Jesus is hanging out with his disciples and he says, listen, he says, guys, if you don't get nothing else, I'm about to be out of here. But listen, by, by this all men will know you are my disciples when you go to church on Sunday mornings. Is that what he said? Come on, some of you know it. By this, all men will know you are my disciples when you give the right amount in an offering. When you sign up for a small group. Is that what he says? Come on, for some of you that know it. He says, all, by this, all men will know you are my disciples if you have, come on, say it with me, love one to another. It's the love of Christ, and, and I wonder, hear me this morning, you can write this down, it's not in your nose. Our dedication to the right cause is what will always bring about converts. It's not a dedication to the right argument. It's not a dedication to the right party. It's not a dedication to the right social media thread. It's not a dedication to the right debate. Hear me this morning. I love you. Go read Mark chapter 12, this same instance. Mark writes it a little bit different. His account is a little bit different. And the Bible says that after Jesus gives his answer, the lawyer looks at Jesus and says, you've answered correctly. And Jesus turns to him and says, the kingdom of God is not far from you. And I love the next part. It says, nobody dared ask another question. <laughs> and I begin to read and I was like, why? Why the, the sudden abruptness of the cutoff? This lawyer who came that day, a lot of theologians believed that he was very close to being converted in that moment. And that the Sadducees and Pharisees shut it down because they didn't want to lose nobody else to the call of Christ. <laughs> and, and I wonder in our life, what would it look like? Again, hear me this morning. Holy Spirit's been working on me on this. That Jesus' death for sinners is the prime example of such love. What though would our church look like? What would your city look like? What would that place that you work at look like? What would your family look different? Not if you got caught up in all of the other stuff of life, but you just walked in and said, you know what? I'm going to love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and I'm going to love my neighbors. What would the impact look like? I don't know the Bible very well. I can't quote a lot of scripture. You don't need to quote a lot of scripture to love people. 
It's good to quote scripture. You need some scripture. But you don't need a lot of scripture just to be able to quote it, just to walk into somebody's life and love and ask about them and, and pray for them. Several weeks ago, I shared a story towards the end of 2020. December 27th, right after Christmas, I get a long text message. Didn't have a name on the number because I didn't have the phone number in my phone. Very long text message. Somebody reaches out, says, hey, they didn't call me Pastor Matt because they didn't know me as Pastor Matt. They'd never been to our church. This young man had never been to our youth group. He's in college now. He was home for the break. I shared this story with my teenagers a couple weeks ago. Get this really long text message. He just says, hey, this is going on in my life, man. I've been battling this. I've been going through this. And you're somebody I just wanted to reach out to. And I was like, yo, this is pretty cool. This fellow reaching out to me. Texting back. Me listen, hey, man, whenever you want to talk, like, come on, man. I'm, I'm here at my office. Two days later, December 29th, he comes to my office. And we're hanging out. And we're talking. And I'm just letting him talk and share what's been going on in his life and in his mind. And I don't know about you, I don't know if you ever wonder, like, why would somebody want to talk to me? I don't know. I know and you're like, well, you're the pastor. Of course they would want to talk to you. But he didn't know me as a pastor. He just knew me as a guy that he saw at a school. I would go to the school campus, hang around. I would be at basketball practice just chilling, hey, helping the coach. And so I'd talk to, you know, him and some other students. Some. So he, he knew me as just coach. That's what he knew me as. And uh, so I asked him, I was like, hey, why, if I can ask you, why did you hit me up? Like, why me? You know other pastors, there's other people in the city, places that you've been. Why did you, why did you reach out to me? And his response was very telling. And I began to try to fight back the tears as this young man began to cry and tell me. He says, you know what, Matt, he goes, I've seen you in the hallways. He goes, people know me for who I am, and a lot of times people want to hang out with me. He says, but I would be in the hallways, and you'd catch me at a game after, after uh, in the gym after a game. He says, and you would always ask me, hey, man, how are you doing? He goes, and I could tell you really meant it because you really wanted to know. And I was like, yeah, man, for sure. And he goes, and I, he goes, one day I'll tell you the rest of the story because by this time he's pretty emotional and he can't talk very well. He said, there was two times in the hallway at school. He goes, you walked in. He goes, and two times I really needed somebody that day to ask me how I was doing. He goes, and you asked, hey, man, how you doing today? He goes, and you'll never know in those two instances I really needed it desperately. It wasn't a scripture that I quoted. After two and, a half two and a half hours of talking to this young man, I led him to Christ right there in my office. He surrendered his life to Jesus. Now going to church back uh, where he's at college, we're finding him a church back where he's at. It wasn't a scripture that I quoted to him. It wasn't a sermon that he heard. It was the love of Christ. What he said to me, I said, what was it? He said, I knew. He goes, I saw something inside of you that I wanted. The love of Christ. And I wonder for you and I, listen, I know this message is not easy. But I wonder what it would look like for you and I again this week as we went. Yes, thank God for his love. And yes, for many of us. And if you don't know Jesus today in a few minutes, I'm going to ask you to make that commitment. I'm going to ask you that question that today could be that day that you experience the love and the freedom of Jesus Christ and the love of your heavenly Father. Thank God for that. But I wonder what our cities would look like, our church, your families, your schools. What would it look like if we begin to walk this week loving our neighbors as ourselves? Despite of their shortcomings, despite of what they've said, despite of what they've done, despite of how they look, despite of their background, we love them just for who they are. Come on, right there in your seats. Come on. Can you throw your hands up as a sign of surrender? Come on. I know, I know Holy Spirit's been dealing with me. Holy Spirit's been dealing with some of you today. This is not a shouting message. This is a message to reflect and to think. But come on, right in your seats this morning. If you don't know Jesus, if you don't know Jesus, you're watching online, I want you to type in, today is the day. Come on, right there, you typed it in, today is the day. That's your sign of a dedication. But if you don't know Jesus today, come on, I want to invite you to know the love of God today. The Bible says that when we confess with our mouths, that we believe with our hearts that Jesus is Lord, that we are saved, that we have a relationship. And listen, God loved you so much that in spite of your shortcomings, in spite of your circumstances, that he sent Jesus and Jesus died on the cross for your sins. It's the greatest gift. And I invite you today to get to know that. So come on, if that's you all, of, all over this place as a family, can we pray this prayer together? 
for those that are maybe in their seats, those that are watching online, those that are locations, that maybe today is the first day they pray this prayer. But come on, all over this place, can we say today, dear God, come on as a family, we're going to pray this prayer together. Dear God, thank you for loving me even though I didn't deserve it. Thank you for loving me in spite of my flaws. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. I believe he was your son. I believe he died for me. And I believe he rose on the third day. And because of him, I can have a relationship with you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Now come on, I, could we stand all over this place? And come on, for the rest of us, and now for all of us, we say, hey, I love God with my heart, soul, mind, and strength, but there's people. Come on, can we throw our hands back up as a sign of surrender? Pastor Matt, there's people in my life. I work with them. I go to school with them. I might be married to them. I don't know. I'm raising them right now. They're my family. But Holy Spirit, come on, now let's pray. Holy Spirit, we need you to live this love out. Holy Spirit, we need you to walk out on Monday into that job, to walk out on Tuesday onto that campus, to be on that sports field with those team members. God, there's people that we disagree. God, they might vote different. They might look different. They might think different. But God, let us look into the eyes of someone that belongs because they are a human. And God, you created them with a purpose, God, and with a design. So God, help us love the way you love us. God, help us forgive the way you forgive us. God, help us reach out with grace and mercy the way you do back to us. Now come on for 60 seconds as you stay there. Come on, our campus pastors are coming. Come on, and our Judson and Juan and Todd Hebrew. Come on for 60 seconds now. Call them out by name. Who is it that you need the Holy Spirit to help love? Who is it you need the Holy Spirit to help you forgive? Holy Spirit, do it today, Jesus. God, help us to love the way you love. God, we need you. God, change our cities. Change our families. Change our schools with the love of Christ. Come on, sing it again. I will. Build my life. Come on, we're building it on the love. It's the love of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Come on, would you just lift your hands? Again, just allow the Holy Spirit. I just sense the Holy Spirit is just, just talking to some of us here today. You know, Jesus, Jesus gives us one of the signs of the end of time. And everybody keeps talking about the things we see happening in our culture. And one of the things that Jesus said in Matthew 24, that it, it will be because of the wickedness abounding so much that the love of many is going to wax cold the wickedness abounding the the lawlessness that's happening what what happens jesus you, you got to be you got to be careful that your love doesn't get hard and it, it it just gets cold and sometimes when you've had friends and family and you've had people in your lives or even just a culture that that keeps doing things that you know that it breaks the heart of God, sometimes we can just give up on love and we can just give up on pursuing them with, with love and, and offering the olive branch of reconciliation. So Jesus said, you got to be careful. And I, 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 won't, I don't want my love to get cold, do you? I, I want it to be fervent. I want it to be hot. 
But again, as Pastor Matt may mention, you see some of the things happening in our culture. You, you hear the stuff. You read the stuff all the time. And if you're not careful, all of a sudden, you, you start becoming very skeptical of everybody and everything. The church can never get that way. You understand? The church was never designed to live our lives that way. We are the ones that's got to be the light and the salt of this work. The world is getting darker because the church is putting our candles underneath the candlestick. we got to put it out on top, right? Come on. He said, you're the salt. You're the seasoning of this culture. Man, this is a great time to be living in right now. Is it difficult? Yes. But he's, he's given us what we need. Amen? I believe that. Wow, thank you, Pastor Matt. That's a great word. A great, it all starts here, doesn't it? It all starts here. Your relationship with your spouse, your kids, your, your, your parents, your friends, your co-workers, it all starts right there. So we got a key word. What do you think that key word ought to be today? How about love? So if you'll get cake your phone, and you will text the word love to 1-540-486-2977. Watching online, here in our campuses, they're going to do it at our other campuses. If you'll text it in, we've got a $250 gift that we're going to give at the end of the month. So we, would just, we just want God to grow our love. Amen. I believe he's going to do that this, this month. And the next Sunday is going to be excited to, just to see what God's going to do. I, I don't know about you. It just breaks my heart to still see so many relationships that's crumbling and falling by the wayside. But God's got a solution for that. Amen. So I just want to pray for you. Remember tonight, our Royal Rangers and Missionettes and our students all start at 430 this afternoon. And uh, then uh, they can have their service, and then that little old Super Bowl game can happen. And uh, if you bet any money and you win, missions is so important. <laughs> Father, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you for this church. God, we thank you for what you're doing. God, there is so many people here. God, we do want to be consumed with your love for us. But then, Lord, we want to pass that love on to other people. God, we ask you, Lord, this week to make us a channel. Lord, let us be a venue in which you can flow through us this week. In our relationships, God, those surface relationships, to the Walmart checker, Lord, to, to the person we pass, God, to the family member that we sat at the dinner table with, God. Let it all start here with loving you and then loving our neighbor in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. Hey, love you. Give the Lord a good hand clap. Be safe. We'll see you next Sunday morning. God bless you.